my lab is, is, is very interested in, in both the basic research on non-coding RNAs and the applied research of utilizing non-coding RNAs to control transcription in epigenetic states. I really am stoked on, on learning about the basic fabric of our existence and, and how cells operate and what controls different states and this, this the complexity is, is mind-boggling. We've gone from a DNA to RNA to protein sort of world to a DNA to RNA to protein to RNA back to DNA and RNA is modulating DNA and, and RNA is guiding proteins to particular regions in the DNA. The, the complexity of the cell has gone up astronomically in just the last 10 years and so looking at it in this, in this big picture and trying to understand to what extent uh, non-coding RNAs and epigenetics in particular uh, govern the selective process or, or, or evolutionary process of the human cell is fascinating to me in, in that context. But equally so is, is the idea that can we utilize the knowledge gained from the basic mechanism in, in a cognitive manner to control gene expression and, and and maybe make a new pharmacopoeia that, if you will, that, could, that can work on, on cancer or, or HIV. Uh, and, and can we use this knowledge to control gene expression in a very specific manner or specific way? RNA interference is a very hot area that, that can specifically target a gene in a post-transcriptional manner and silence that gene very, very well. Uh, the problem is, is that you have to consistently add your small interfering RNA to get that effect. The advantages to the epigenetic targeting and, and using an endogenous mechanism that's already in place to target epigenetic states in human cells is that if you get the right spot to target, in theory you can target that for a week, remove your small RNA and that gene stays down. It doesn't go completely off and we have reason, we've figured out why that is the case, but it goes down 80-90% and stays that way 30, 30, 40 days. So it's the long-term duration of effect that you can gain from this, from utilizing the non-coding RNA pathway and transcriptional modulation or transcriptional silencing. And then off-target effects are real. They occur no matter what you do. Whenever you do anything to a cell, you mod, you're, you're manipulating it and you're going to have an effect. It's like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You can't do it and <laughs> not have an effect. Um, and so, yeah, we see, we see off-target effects uh, in the case of overexpressing um, non-coding RNAs. In the context of HIV, we can target HIV in a, in, in a very efficacious manner and turn it off transcriptionally. However, when we do it, we use lentiviral vectors and we notice when we express high, high levels of our, sing these are single-stranded antisense RNAs, when we express high levels and do a microarray, we see a couple of what are called SNORDs. And SNORDs are these uh, ribosomal associated RNAs that bind to other RNAs and methylate them. So what happens is you overexpress a bucket load of RNA in the cell, the cell responds and says, I got all this RNA, I need to control it. And so that's the off-target effect we found. Now there are other off-target effects, you could end up targeting a different gene or whatnot, but that's the off-target effect we found. Um, and that's a problem if you're going to constitutively express your non-coding RNA. However, the advantage to, non to transcriptional silencing, at least based on the literature and, and, and what I've seen in the field so far, is that you can get transcriptional silencing at a particular targeted site when you get 20-fold excess of your RNA for three to four days of expression. If you can get enough RNA into that targeted cell for that period of time and remove it, that gene will stay down 80-90%. So if there are off-target effects, you're, you're coming in, you're hitting it fast, and you're moving away, and the gene stays down. So that's your advantage to transcriptional regulation using non-coding RNAs compared to post-transcriptional where you constantly have to hit it with your small RNAs. There are off-target effects. Anytime we put a, a non-coding RNA into cells, we're usurping the non-coding RNA pathway, just like RNA interference usurps the, po the post-transcriptional pathway. Um, but the advantage to the non-codings in transcriptional silencing is that you can hit it, blast it real quick, and your RNA goes away, and that gene stays down. So that's the real advantage, I think. I see we're moving from a one drug, one target, sort of paradigm that we're in in, pharma, in, in the pharma, pharmacopoeia industry to a one drug, 15, 20 targets. And we can do that. It, you know, for instance, if hep, you know, an hepatocellular carcinoma has 17 genes, 14 of them are overexpressed and three of them are underexpressed. We can go and pick those 17 genes and we can take the 14 and we can shut them down transcriptionally by targeting their promoter. And the three that are underexpressed, we can turn on by knocking down their non-coding RNA. And the idea is that you can make one molecule 
that can that can that can do this. And, and we're working on this actively here at Scripps, where we have one nanoparticle that can that can bring in the payload, if you will, to modulate these 17 genes.